Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Mental Health Monday. I'm really excited uh, for today's guest. We're going to be talking to Jason Gant. Um, really, really super happy to have you on here. Actually, Kevin of Laugh for Purpose is the one who connected us, and I'm eternally grateful uh, for him for suggesting that and for, I guess, uh, prepping you a little bit for it too. <laughs> but Jason is a learning designer and facilitator with a specific interest in mindfulness and athletics. He has helped support healthy and inclusive communities, youth, workplaces, and teams globally, and is a certified mindfulness EQ coach trained through Search Inside Yourself, the global mindfulness platform developed at Google. He's also a business development lead designing the first youth and teen mindfulness stress reduction and relaxation uh, program in Northern California for Kaiser Permanente. His experience and practice allowed him to join Calm as a, beha a global behavioral health coach and corporate meditation instructor for the Wellbeing app. I have some socials for you. I also have uh, some information on his online class. So if you're interested in checking any of those out, you can peep all of the things that I just popped into the chat. And Jay Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited for, to have you on. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is a pleasure, especially over the holiday weekend. So thank you for everyone joining. So can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences and what made you become interested in specializing in mindfulness? Yeah, definitely. So when you ask that question, uh, a specific story comes to mind and it's, in, in the realm of sports and particularly working um, as a coach at a JC, work, uh, as a basketball coach. And we made it to the California Final Four of junior colleges of basketball. And so it's the Final Four, it's tied at halftime. With two minutes to go, we're down one and we ended up losing by 11. Oh. And so in those last two minutes, it was that intensity only being down one, tied at halftime, basically zero zero, going into two minutes in the game, down one, really it became a mental game. And who was able to withstand the intensity that the game called for? And so seeing that happen so quickly, literally in the two minutes, um, piqued my interest of, you know, how do I support these athletes? How do I support these men in being in the moment, being mm -hmm. present for all of the things that we practiced, that we had gone through in film, that we had understood to get us to that point. So how could it unravel? And so it was clear to me that there was a mental component and not just physical. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm i not a huge basketball fan. I know you know, vaguely of basketball, but with any sports, I mean, I played soccer and it's one of those things that you can get completely in your head and you lose yeah. the game because you're in your head instead of in the moment. Um, exactly. which, which is just one of those things that it doesn't make sense. Sometimes whenever you're in the game, you're like, no, we're, I have to focus on what I'm focusing on. But it's more like if you, if you're able to take that step and take that breath and really focus down, then you can do a lot more. Um, and you can, you can understand the bigger picture a little bit. So, um, even though, even though I didn't play basketball or anything, <laughs> I, I still get, I still get it a little bit and it is, it's really important. Um, and especially, um, it, especially in an intense, something that's really intense like that last two minutes of the game, <laughs> La yeah. final four. I mean, that's big. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, what's, what really stuck out to me too is, you know, it was the most intense part of the game and it was the most intense part of our season. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about the word intensity and in relation to athletes, you would think that intensity is the competition. And that's what athletes are going for. So regardless of sport, you're going after that competition and you want to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't able to do that, then that's where the mental skills needed to come in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Laugh for Purposes here says two of the best people in the mental health world. Love both of y'all. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you, my man. Thank Brian, you, thank good you. to see you as well. So what's your favorite thing about working in this field and what are some of the biggest challenges you've seen? Yeah, I would really say um, there's really no bounds. Um, when we think, when we talk about mindfulness and present moment, it's really about meeting people where they're at. 
And when you're meeting people where they're at, I get to be on the sideline of a basketball game. I get to be in corporate um, spaces, facilitating trainings and at Kaiser developing youth and teen course. So it really allows me to play in different um, settings. But as we talk about behavior and as we talk about well-being, really looking at the full human lifespan of development, working with youth and teens all the way up through adults and athletes. So seeing the breadth and the value within mindfulness amongst different sectors and ages, genders, ethnicities is the most fun and interesting part because it really allows me to grow seeing other helping and supporting other people in their next step. So I would say that's the most fun and fun part about being in this work. Uh, the most difficult part I would say is communicating the true impact when folks are able to simply go online and, and see that, oh, there's a three breath practice. You can think, oh, I, I know mindfulness and I'll just do my three breaths in the morning and that's gonna set me up for the whole day. And if it doesn't work, then I'm mindfulness doesn't work. And so the balance between um, practice and, and understanding mm -hmm. would be the, the most challenging is, is getting folks to understand that, hey, you may understand it, but there's actually a practice to it. Yeah. Um, do you, so have you found that there's a difference between working with kids and adults? Are there, are kids more receptive to learning things? Is this like, I can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of thing? Or, or uh, do you think that adults are, are just as receptive to it? Yeah, I think both are receptive. Um, I don't think there's one or the other. Again, when you're meeting folks where they're at, then it's an interest-based curiosity that really leads. And when you follow that lead, then it's, it's no one pushing one thing or another. We're just meeting each other where we're at and using skills to support our next best. So I wouldn't say that uh, kids or adults are easier or harder. I would just say the um, questions are different. Mm -hmm. But when we're leading with curiosity, it's all it all um, becomes that's like, again, that's the fun in it. Yeah. Outside of, of what you do for kind of a living, what are some of your favorite hobbies? And do you draw personally a distinction between what you consider a hobby and what you consider self-care? Yeah, that's a great question. So my, my hobby is I enjoy sports, you know, movies, comedies, um, love travel, um, yeah, just being in those moments and, and really feeling them, you know, so some of those, those comedies, I find myself cracking up and when I'm traveling, I find myself trying new foods. Um, so just being in those moments, mm -hmm. but your question of can you repeat that question? The, the the distinction between hobbies and and self care, and yeah. Self care, yeah. I think there's definitely a, a crossover, um, but I think the the true difference there is the intention. Mm -hmm. um, what is the intention behind the action or the event happening? If I'm if I love to play the guitar as a hobby and I'm just playing the guitar every you know I play the guitar 30 minutes every night or a certain many hours every week. If that's something that's habitual to me routine, then that might be a hobby. But mm -hmm. if I pick up that guitar to try to feel better because I had a tough day, then that might be a self care act. Yeah. And so that's how I see them intersecting and supporting each other. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think the what makes them intersect again is that curiosity and the interest. And the curiosity allows us 
to follow that interest, which can turn into a hobby. And you know what, I want to do this again and again, and turn this into a routine, or with intention, understanding that I understand that this is what I can do to help me feel better in this moment after occasions or triggers like this one. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of the same, but different. Yeah. And I, I, I love that because I consider most of the time painting my nails to be self care. And right now they're very short because I had some breakages when I was in Florida. And so they're growing out right now. So I haven't done any like major art or anything. So when I was painting my nails this last time, you know, I went with a straight color. I didn't take the time to really, um, focus on what I was doing. I was just like, all right, got to get this. Okay, let's do another coat. All right, let's do another coat. And I, when I look at it from that, I'm like, that wasn't self care. But when I take four hours to do my nails, like whenever they're grown out and I'm trying to do nail art and everything, I really do focus on, you know, what am I feeling today? What am I, what am I trying to get out? What am I trying to work out and focus on like, all right, let's think through it while we're doing this and make it an intentional kind of moment. Um, and it's one of the few things that, uh, if I'm painting my nails, I can't, that's one of the things that like, I can't help my kids at that time. And so it's like, I can't help you. You got to figure it out. I, my nails are wet. I literally can't open that jar for you. It's not happening. They're going to be wet for the next four hours. Cause it's going to take me that long to do them. And so it's a way for me to just kind of take that time and be like, okay, First of all, help them with their problem solving skills, right? Because I can't do whatever it is for them. But also to say like, hey, I'm taking some time to do something for myself and I'm really focusing on what I need to work out right now. So, you know, it's, um, but yeah, you could definitely have weeks like this week where I was just painting my nails. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't self care. I was just getting it done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's a great example, you know, and, and as I think about that, just reflecting, I think back to in college and before I was doing this work and in school, I just had probably two emotions. It was like either I'm feeling good or bad. And I remember when I would feel bad, I would go to the gym and I'd play basketball. That was option one. Option two is just go to sleep. And when you wake up, hopefully it's gone. <laughs> and I distinctly remember those being my only options. And wow. so to your question now, as I, you know, now doing this work, you know, I had the intention and understanding that, okay, if I go to the gym, that'll make me feel better. If I move my body, that'll make me feel better. Or if I just go stillness and just turn off, it'll make me feel better. Yeah. There was no in between. Mm -hmm. And so you know, this question is making me reflect on like, there was a piece of self care within that. But I think the hobby and the passion and the interest of basketball and being in the gym and moving led that led that charge more so than understanding like, oh, this is a piece of self care. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't think you have to call it self-care for it to be self-care necessarily. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're I mean, recognizing it, then that's great. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I'm saying, I guess that's where the intention makes it so mm -hmm. much more powerful. Yeah. Because if, if I knew that, you know, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out and I'm doing this for self-care because I know I need to. Yeah. And I guess with that, what we're saying is that just understanding that there's a proactive tool that you can mm -hmm. turn to. You don't have to be in crisis or in trigger or triggered to do something. And so I guess the self-care piece for me is the thinking about the proactivity. Had I known or had the intention of this is also self-care, you know, granted, I know I'm doing exercise and whatnot, but I'm thinking about like basketball. And had I thought of that as self-care, mm -hmm. then possibly it's like, all right, I know I have three exams this week, so I know I'm, I need to, I'm not going to skip the gym mm -hmm. versus I have three exams this week, so I'm going to skip the gym right. and be in the library. And so again, the power is coming from that intention, mm -hmm. but of, of understanding, so like you're saying, that innate understanding versus choosing to that choice. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. So you said you said one of your hobbies was travel. Have you missed that the past like year and a half, or have you still been traveling in this in this time? No, no, I'm in I'm in San Francisco. Um, so we've had pretty strict or open communication about the pandemic and yeah. rates and you know vaccine vaccinations and being a public health undergrad major, I I went ahead and I stayed indoors. <laughs> So yes, um, good, good, good. <laughs> it's, it's funny to to. It's like my life is upside down, or I don't know what. But public health was my undergrad, and I said no to public health then to go into finance and you know consulting, fi- chasing that prestige and luxur- luxurious mm-hmm. life. I thought, and now. I went back to school and got a dual degree in behavioral health and business. Nice. And here we are looking at the country or the world and saying, hey, do we get the economy back going or do we get our health back going? <laughs> and so it's it's very interesting to, to have a foot in both circles and to right. see what's actually happening and then to see the different responses and how communication is coming out. And so you, to your, to your question, no, I have not been traveling. <laughs> yeah. Do you miss it though? I, I have been missing it. Yeah. Um, but um, I've also had the opportunity and chance just to really connect with my circle and folks that I'm tight with. Like we've been, hanging out in, you know, in small, you know, just me and them or, um, you know, going to a park or going on walks. One thing that has, you know, as we talk about incorporating travel, I guess, I have been going to parks more. So Mm -hmm. maybe not traveling out of state lines or out of the city per se, but I have been going out of my neighborhood and just doing more walks, getting out into fresh air. So I guess I have been traveling. You know, yeah. I've been been cross city traveling, exploring my neighborhood, exploring other neighborhoods, getting some vitamin D through natural sunlight. Um, so in that regard, I guess I have been traveling and taking my dog out um, on what I call field trips now to just different <laughs> parts. <laughs> you know, instead of our normal walks around the block, we're doing field trips. So um, we've kept it entertaining. Um, by being more interested in the things around us opposed to just walking by and you know taking it for granted yeah that's great i at the very beginning of the pandemic whenever we did go into lockdown here in texas and please just ignore everything in texas right now like i i I can't i can't deal with it but (laughs) what i was saying at the very beginning of the pandemic um that I would see so many people because I was already working, working from home. And so I'd see so many people walking by that I didn't recognize just in my neighborhood because they were working from home. They were doing school from home, whatever it was, they were able to get out and really, um, safely connect with people around them. Like, you know, I would see people standing on one side of the street, talking to people across the other side of the street and just, uh, making that connection where they wouldn't have otherwise, if we had all been in our downtown offices, you know, all day so uh i think yeah yeah there has been some good uh to come out of this i do think do you have a serial killer or true crime story that fascinates you i mean i i mean one doesn't come to mind except for like someone that would wasn't there someone that would eat there the people that they would. Yeah. So there have, um, there have been a couple of people who have done that. I mean, there's the famous Donner party, right? They yeah. ate each other, yes. but, um, then there was, um, I'm thinking about just like not a party. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, there was another one there. There have been a couple where they would either feed other people parts of parts of their victims or eat parts of their victims. Um, yeah. I mean, that's pretty gnarly. And I mean, all of them are, I mean, that's, that's, that's just one that sticks out because it's Mm -hmm. it's like, 
you know, humans eating humans. Yeah. After you've already done something in mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, that kind of sticks out, but I don't have a, that that's what comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. How about a favorite podcast? Is there a favorite podcast? And you and you can't say laugh for purpose, although laugh for purpose is wonderful. Um, and and I'm going to plug them right now because if you haven't gone to laughforpurpose.com, uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat. Uh, you should right now do that. But aside from Kevin's Check podcast, out laugh for purpose definitely. <laughs> check out. Um, shout out Kevin. Um, favorite podcast? I mean, podcast that I listen to. Um, TED Radio Hour. Um, oh, I love that. <laughs> Hidden Brain. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Gervais, like his podcasts. Um, but I also like um, stories. Uh, what's the NPR podcast that plays just tells the stories? Those are really good. So there's a couple. There's um, there's the one where the tagline is storytelling with a beat. I really like that one, but I can't think of the name. Uh, there's another one that's like this American life. That's a good one. Um, I know there are others and I just, I've just blanked on the names of them. Yeah. Yeah. So many good ones. Yeah. Um, but I, I like a good story. Um, I like storytelling. I also enjoy just hearing how others are maneuvering the world. You mm -hmm. know, uh, that's, whether it's through like a fictional story or through a real life story um, or just hearing like, how did you deal with that situation from the Oprah Super Soul Sunday conversations to Michael Gerbe's interviews around different athletes and high achieving um, corporate CEOs, just how are they navigating the world? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> it seems yeah. there's, there's some habits that you can, that you can pick up. Um, but the way in which those habits intertwine, um, can be so creative. And so it's just interesting hearing how people design their life and make it mm -hmm. happen. I like that, how they design their lives, because that there is a definite intentionality about it. Uh, when you listen to a lot of those stories, it's like, you know, I, I didn't just go around eating a pine cone every day. I ate a pine cone because of this and that. And the pine cone was yeah. prepared this way. And <laughs> yeah. don't yeah. don't like like side note, don't eat pine cones. I'm sure it's not good for you. <laughs> I guess it's a lot of fiber, but don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going along with you right there. Like, yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't. definitely got the point. I got your point. <laughs> uh, Kevin said, Jason saved my life. It wasn't the interview itself, but just the time chatting with Jason offline changed my life. That's amazing. That is fantastic, Kevin. Seriously. No, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the transparency and the time to connect. You know, this is just the space and the platform as we're talking about here, you know, just how did folks how do folks move and why mm -hmm. do you kind of move that way? And, you know, not having any judgments towards, you know, hearing folks stories just being open to it. And that, I think that allows for a connection and that connection is the energy that, you know, even brought us here today. So, yeah, absolutely. So our, our topic tonight is mindfulness and well-being and the intersection with DEI. Uh, so when I say the word mindfulness, it's a pretty broad term, and it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean different things to different people. So how do you define mindfulness, and what do you feel is the common perception of mindfulness today? Yeah, so my definition of mindfulness is awareness of mind and body with an attitude of curiosity and kindness. So mind, body, curiosity, kindness. I love that. And so that mind, body is just a integration. It's a, it's a dropping down. It's a grounding. It's a being in your body, understanding what's happening. It's one system. Often, you know, in the U.S., we like to think of the mind and body as two separate things. But as we both, you know, started off the show talking about the soccer and the sports, 
you know, the mind body connection is one and athletes really understand that. But when it comes to healthcare or taking care of ourselves, we think of them kind of separate. And so really that's what behavioral health is, is really that integration of mind and body. And so mindfulness is taking it a step further and saying, hey, within your mind and body, be kind, be curious, be interested. Because we're out here living amongst community. And so your lived reality is a little different than mine. Mm -hmm. And so how can we find the commonality within that difference? or just have understanding that there is difference mm -hmm. without judgment. And so that's why we lean on the curiosity and kindness. And that's truly what makes it mindful. And that's why it is mindfulness because it's an understanding and an action. It's an understanding of mind and body, but then the action of curiosity and kindness. It's very easy to understand how you feel someone just cut me off in traffic i saw it with my eyes so i know in my physical body i am getting upset i'm about to flip my lid and i'm ready to like i'm ready for road rage but that second step or going a little bit deeper is that curiosity and kindness mm -hmm. offering kindness followed that by curiosity you know, this person must be in a rush. I hope they get there safely. I'm glad that we actually did not get in an accident. And then moving from that place instead of the road rage. So we have both options and we always have both options. Mm -hmm. But in that moment of intensity, like my team, sometimes it feels like we only have one option. And that option is the intensity that we feel, which then sends us into that fight or flight state that says, right. I'm not okay, I must run. And when we're running from our goal, we're not helping ourselves. So yeah. that's why it's even more potent that we have this kindness mm -hmm. and, and follow that curiosity, which is ultimately just an interest. Curiosity is about having that wonder and that interest in the unknowing. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's great. I, um, I always tell myself whenever somebody cuts me up in traffic, cause I have a tendency to get pretty, pretty upset when someone's in my way, <laughs> when I drive and my, mm -hmm. my 14 year old can vouch for this. Cause we had a conversation about it the other day, but, um, I'm always just like, come on, if you're not, if you're not going to go the speed limit, go the other like, scoot over, whatever it is. But, um, if somebody cuts me off or whatever, I have to, it is, it's that initial reaction of what the hell, man. But then I always tell myself, you know what? Their mom must have just had a heart attack. Maybe their yeah. wife is in the car and, and having a baby right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't know what's yeah. going on in someone else's life. And it, but it does like my initial reaction is that, Hey man, what the hell? But it takes just a couple seconds to reframe it a little bit. And, and, and I think the, it's important to do it. Yeah, no, and that, and it happens to all of us. You're not mm -hmm. alone happens to me. It's not, it's, you know, it's very kind of confusing, right? It's like, I just felt that. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? I offer kindness now. Like, mm -hmm. I just felt disrespected. And so, as you said, if we can cultivate those couple seconds of a pause or a stop or um, just a coming back, a grounding, a centering from that extremity that just happened. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need mean that we need to follow the extremity. It means, hey, something extreme just happened. Maybe I need to stop and, and recenter. And depending on your practice, your understanding, that may be a couple seconds to, we need to slow down for the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So depending on what your response is and, you know, a multitude of things, but understanding that there is that pause. And then mindfulness, we actually call it the sacred pause. Oh, I like that. That moment where we just take a second for ourselves. 
to just get back online, to get back into that window of tolerance. The sacred pause. That's really poetic. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think is the kind of more common perception of mindfulness today? Do you think it's that or do you think that it's something else? I think the perception of mindfulness is that it is easy that I can turn it on and off when I ever, whenever I would like to. And I think that is also the danger yeah. because, you know, whenever, regardless if it's mindfulness or, or any interest, you know, sometimes when we think we're too good at it is when it comes to bite us. And unfortunately, or fortunately, we're talking about emotions and moods. And so, you know, we've seen the extremities and the differences of like ultra kindness. We're seeing, um, you know, the world chef going all over the world after these disasters, providing meals for folks. Um, but then we also see horrendous things that are happening in the world. And so the, the, the danger or the tricky part is how do I, or how do folks understand that it is a practice, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned before the cognitive understanding versus the bodily feeling in your body. But then being able to see, oh, three breaths is a practice. Yeah. And three breaths may not be able to sustain your day if mm -hmm. you have, you know, five negotiation meetings. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the three breath practice that you just looked up may not sustain that. Yeah, you may you may need some coaching or a group class or a deeper practice to get to that point where three breaths is helpful. Mm -hmm. But three breaths works because it creates that sacred pause. Yeah. So the the misconception is that mindfulness is easily understood, and thus can be easily practiced mm -hmm. when catches that it must be a practice for it to be an understanding like that yeah i mean the so the three breaths is like it's a tool in a tool set and the mindfulness as the practice it's and so people see a tool it's like i mean it's just like with any other um any other thing in health people see a tool and they're like, okay, so if I implement this tool, it'll fix me or it'll fix yeah. this problem that I'm having. When really what you're addressing is one very small part of the whole picture. So you got to get that whole picture in there. I like that. Exactly. No, that's a great, that's a great, um, that's great vocabulary around that is the three breaths is a tool. Mindfulness is the perspective. And so yeah. the tool enhances the perspective. So how many tools do we have in our toolbox to even have a perspective? And are we trying to pull out tools when we haven't practiced at all? Mm -hmm. And so I love that vocabulary. We've talked a little bit about that mindfulness, you have to work on it, right? Is it always work? Like, or does it come naturally after you practiced it for a while? Does it start to come naturally? Like, do you personally find yourself practicing mindfulness very naturally or does it still work for you? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one is, is it work? I would say that meditation, which we haven't really touched on, is a piece or another tool for mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, meditation is the practice of focusing and concentration. And I think that they intertwine and support each other, but the 
the thing that makes mindfulness so interesting is to your question, you can do mindfulness in any form or fashion. Whereas meditation is a very dedicated practice, mm -hmm. kind of like going to the gym. You go to the gym, you lift those weights for a dedicated amount of time, you do so many reps, so many sets. And that's the meditation practice, which supports your mindfulness practice, which supports the perspective, which can be another tool. Mindfulness, on the other hand, is something that is about enhancing your awareness to the present moment in a certain way, which I said was curiosity and kindness. So to that point, we can play basketball mindfully, soccer mindfully, we can cook mindfully, eat mindfully. You know, as you even mentioned, doing your nails. You can do that mindfully using the different colors, smelling scents. Not that there's scents, but noticing. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> no, all the different, all the different parts of doing your nails. There yeah, are definitely different exactly. scents. All Probably different some you shouldn't like inhale a whole yeah, bunch, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you know noticing the different smells and the yeah. different parts as you say to that process can make it mindful mm -hmm. and so at that point we can make it fun mindfulness doesn't have to be about just three breaths and being still in lotus position and everything must be quiet but it can actually be about hey let's go get some shots up and let's have a mindful walk or, you know, let's just go mindfully sit outside and watch the sunset and watch the birds and notice the breeze on our face. And all of that counts because it's that awareness of mind and body with an attitude of curiosity and kindness, the acceptance of it all. Mm -hmm. And so I would say mindfulness is creative and we can be creative in mindfulness create our own practices which is what allows us to have fun with it which allows us to meet people where we're at where they're at and actually have impact actually create community and so meditation i brought that in to share the differences between a dedicated practice where yes it is more going to be seated in a certain posture or laying down or not moving because we're we're practicing our focus which then turns into our concentration which allows us to manage our own experience manage what we're dictating if we can concentrate and focus so mindfulness allows many more entries and allows us allows folks to try it where they feel most comfortable Are there some easy ways to practice mindfulness when you're in, in different environments like work and home and, and when you're playing basketball? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we just were to think about it in, you know, in a most macro perspective, how do we find the sacred pause? And where can we take a sacred pause? When is it okay? And that's the creativity, the innovation, and where we can have some fun in designing how to create a mindfulness practice. One that throws a lot of folks off in the corporate space is just a moment to arrive before meetings. Corporate meetings, executives, wanting to get work done, having very little time, having to make a lot of decisions. They want to get in the meeting and just start talking. Some folks haven't even stopped their previous thought from the last meeting. Some folks are already thinking about solutions, problems, or adversities that they have from that last meeting. And so I often start meetings with a moment to arrive just to say, hey, let's connect our mind to our body right now. Especially in this virtual setting where it's very easy for us to 
go on and off screen where we can sign on to be on screen, but clearly be doing other things. <laughs> and so we just take literally a moment, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, just to, you know, slow down, take that sacred pause or create that sacred pause by doing nothing and saying, hey, let's have a moment to connect mind to body, to actually be here with this group. We've dedicated this time and space, so I, let's actually take advantage. So whatever you know, thoughts, feelings you had from before, you know, let them go right now so that we can put our best foot forward during this hour. And just, you know, that a lot of times takes folks off guard from starting a corporate meeting in that way, but can be very helpful in just setting the tone and then impactful in the work that we actually get done. When we think about in athletic, in athletic moments, I just read that Steph Curry is able to slow his heart rate down in a matter of a timeout by controlling his breath. And so if you just think about that, you know, from a professional standpoint, especially thinking about the Warriors or championship level teams, you know, we used to think, oh, it must have been their physical talents. Look at all these threes Curry can make. But how about the ability to control his breath in the, in the duration of a timeout mm -hmm. and to significantly reduce his beats per minute? when other players are still trying to get water, they're trying to, get, they're huffing and puffing while still trying to listen to the coach and what play is going on. Meanwhile, Curry is finding that sacred pause, controlling and managing his breath while taking in whatever else is going on. The engagement and awareness of mind and body, curiosity and kindness. Hey, what's next? I'm interested, I'm here. So that's where we can take advantage in that timeout, but then we see where that actually plays out on the court. So it's those small moments like that that can very easily get overlooked, yet can have profound effects and impacts. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Like I I I guess I I know that you can control your, you know, your heart rate and everything through breathing. And that's, but I never thought of it in the span of a timeout. <laughs> like I never would have, I never would have thought like, how quickly can you, I don't think I ever would have tried to put in that. How quickly can you, you know, yeah. control your heart, control your heart rate. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Athletes, athletes come up with some of the darnest things. Huh? I mean, I was with, I was with <laughs> a friend, friend the other day that played football in college and, you know, we're, we're waiting for to cross the street. And once we were able to cross the street, you know, they have the countdown of how many seconds, or I don't know if they have that in Texas. In California, there's like a countdown before the, the light's going to turn red and you should mm -hmm. not cross it. And so as we're talking about sports and just, you know, everyday uh, relevancy, he was like, man, we have all that time. Like I could run up 340s in that time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, like who is thinking about running the 40 we're just crossing the street but he's right. like that amount of time like I could have ran a 40 yard dash in that time it's like mm -hmm. all right I didn't wasn't playing football at that level so <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh that's great Hey, Angel, welcome on in. If you guys have any questions, uh, the guest tonight is Jason Gann. We were talking about mindfulness, well-being, and the intersection with DEI. So uh, if you have any questions about that, please pop them into the chat and happy, happy to address those. The past year and six months have really challenged a lot of people in a lot of different ways. We've kind of already talked about some of the challenges, but are there any specific challenges to mindfulness um, in today's world? And I'm thinking about you talking about the Zoom meetings already and and just kind of like everything's a distraction. Um, and do you feel that any aspect of mindfulness has been made easier in the last year and six months? Oh, definitely, definitely easier. In, in the just in the slowing down of people, you know, this, as we talk about awareness of mind and body, 
we're talking about the self. And so folks have been forced to slow down, forced to think about their patterns, forced to think about their behaviors and being indoors all day. How am I going to act when I go outdoors? How am I going to act, interact with someone that doesn't have a mask? So, so much has become about behavior. And what we actually want is compassionate behavior and kindness. And for us to understand that we're all going through this together, there's not one person better than the other or one group better than the other. And so we now have that opportunity from everyone slowing down, everyone being more self-reflective, whether you wanted to or not, and giving us the platform and the space to have conversations like this. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for having this discussion and having using your platform um, and getting the word out there about mental health and its importance because it truly is important and folks need to know that they're not alone, that we all need support. We've all needed support at one time or another. And, you know, I really appreciate this, this platform that you're sharing and for having me on as a guest. Mindfulness is just one, one piece, one, um, one tool in our toolkit, you know, as we talk about the full, what could be a toolkit for mental health, mm -hmm. mindfulness is just one piece, it's not the end all be all, but it's the piece that I think allows me to meet folks where they're at and to still provide impact without, without you know, diagnosing or saying mm -hmm. that this is what's wrong with you in order for me to support you. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, talking about mental health, I think is something that um, ha it's just increasingly easier and easier to talk to people about it. And I've, I've noticed since I started talking more openly about mental health and focusing on mental health, that it's, it's become easier and easier. And even, um, even now, you know, it's, it's like mental health is health. It, it's got that word in there. You've got mental health care. You've got your physical health care. It's it's, but they're both health care, right? So, um, I think whenever the pandemic started, um, at least my company, I know some other companies as well did this, but they sent out a memo and they were like, if you need extra counseling sessions, like this shit sucks for everybody. So if you need, if you need some extra help right now, it's understandable. We want you to get that help. Here are resources. And mm -hmm. where before, you know, before I started talking about anything mental health related, um, and I was still with the same company, but back then, you know, three years ago, it wouldn't have been talked about at all. Like that wouldn't have been a thing that would have been considered. And so I think part of, um, not only the pandemic, but where mental health acceptance was, was trending. Cause everyone has mental health. Everyone, one in two people are going to struggle with mental illness at some point in their life. Everyone has mental health, hundred percent of people have mental health. And so I think that it's gotten easier and easier to talk about it. Um, and mindfulness is a big piece of that. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the WHO actually defines mental health as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or, her, his or her own abilities, can cope with normal stress stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their community. And so thinking about mental health in that context with that definition, if we look at it from a macro perspective, it's, I hear, are you doing okay? Or are you not doing okay? And no more than that. Are you okay? Or are you not okay? And if you're not okay, then we need to support you. And if you are okay, then wonderful. How can you support someone else? And so, yeah, mental health is huge. And mm -hmm. we think that it needs to be some clinical 
huge diagnosis where, you know, this person is so far gone that, you know, that was a mental right. health issue where I'm not feeling so good today. And I don't know why, maybe it's because it's like not sunny outside, but maybe there's something deeper going on. Or, you know, maybe I didn't get that good morning from my partner like I wanted to or mm -hmm. whatever it could be. Am I doing okay or am I not doing okay? And is there support? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's important to have that support even when you're doing okay. And that's, I think that's yep. where that's where that mindfulness piece comes in is, is you knowing where you are because you don't want to get to where you're having a breakdown. Like you don't want to get to the point where you're, you're past the point of no return or, or you're just kind of to a point where you're non-functional. Like I, I experienced burnout, um, this year and it was not fun. It's not, it's not a pleasant thing, but like I allowed myself to get there. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, I could have stopped it at some point. Like had I been more mindful, I think about what I needed and what I was, was going through. I think that that could have been something that, um, I could have controlled a little bit better now that you can control everything. I wish, uh, <laughs> but you know, if we have that mindfulness about ourselves and, and that mind body connection, um, and approaching it from that aspect of curiosity, I think that's a really nice way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. So I want to shift slightly from talking about mindfulness generally and well-being in general, um, and focus on how they interrelate between mental health and diversity, equity, inclusion. That DEI piece, uh, broad strokes. Can you kind of break that down for us? Yeah, so I just kind of shared the, the definition of mental health. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, with diversity being really about variety, having a mix. Um, equity is really about having that quality of being impartial and fairness. And fairness, not... not everyone gets the same same thing but everyone gets what they need in order to succeed and that level of equity really creates a sense of belonging and when we talk about mindfulness which is that mind body awareness of the present moment then we're truly talking about belonging. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about belonging in spaces wherever I go, wherever the I goes. So mindfulness and diversity, equity, inclusion really go hand in hand because as I, it, it truly creates a freeway or a just a smoother passage to have communication. Um, you know, I like to say that mindfulness is kind of like a bridge. You know, it's not going to solve our problems for us. It's not going to start the, the podcast. You know, it's not going to do its own mental health Mondays. But it will allow us and create the conditions for us to put our best foot forward. Mm -hmm put our best foot forward, who knows what comes of that. So diversity, equity, inclusion, mindfulness creates the communication or the allows you to drive through that, that bridge. Yeah. Are there really any... Have. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah, it's really how you, mindfulness is a way in which you really navigate the bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mindfulness bridge. Um, and gives 
vocabulary and language to be able to connect with others. So that's what we're really trying to do is have folks connect from different backgrounds in a singular place at a singular point of time. And how do we get each of these individuals to feel a sense of belonging mm -hmm. at that point in time? And it's really through understanding, through listening, through being curious and less judgmental that we get there. Yeah. I, I think that that's the part of um, everyone feeling like they have a voice. And But it's not just that they can get there because you're right. You can give everyone the tools. You can give everyone the tools they need, not just everyone the same tools. You can give everyone the tools that they need. But if they don't feel like they belong, they're still not going to feel comfortable um, using their voice. And so I, it's, it's really important to kind of all, like all of that has to be there. Otherwise, if you're just, if you're just looking at diversity, then you're not necessarily going to get everyone to, um, provide they bring their best value. They're not going to bring their best selves to whatever it is you're trying to do. Are there any barriers to focusing on DEI as part of, or in conjunction with mindfulness? Yeah, I would say a real tough one has been in general, but then drilling down or double clicking on it, even uh, for me has been with men and training men has been compassion. Mm -hmm. I'd say that is the biggest barrier is this compassion. Um, and folks feeling vulnerable and compassion rather than strength. Um, and so I think men have had a harder time with this showing of compassion, being kind and considerate, especially amongst each other. You know, when we're, when we think, especially around sports and locker rooms, we think about toxic masculinity. So the notion of compassion and how to have compassion would be the, the biggest hurdle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think compassion is really having empathy for others and it's the doing, it's the action part. And so we get a little deeper than the understanding of someone else's experience, which is empathy. And we go deeper by then having an action with that understanding. And that's what makes it compassion. That's what makes it a compassionate action is that I felt the, I felt the empathy and then I did something about it. And I would say maybe that's the biggest barrier is creating the community. Mm -hmm. You know, for, we have the self-awareness piece of understanding my mind and body but then outwardly, how do I understand myself enough to be in service of my community mm -hmm. and to uplift and support others? And so that's really a compassionate stance. And so I say compassion would be a barrier. Yeah. So how do, how do you go about overcoming that? I mean, you talked about kind of the locker room environment um, and toxic mas masculinity piece. How would you overcome that if you were uh, put in, kind of involving yourself in the resolution of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the bigger, bigger question that I'm hearing in that is um, how do you work in groups mm -hmm. and for me, I, I, my first thought to that is wearing the hat, you know, getting the experience, whether it's just volunteering, working, um, but getting that experience. And so I've had that experience working with athletes. I've had the experience of doing mindfulness in juvenile hall, had the experience of doing mindfulness with neurodivergent youth. And so having this wealth of experience using this behavior change tool 
allows me to see how it works in the different ages, the different groups, the different um, interests that people have. And so then going back into your question of how do you train compassion? Because I've been in these locker rooms, I don't have a problem speaking up about it mm -hmm. and calling it out. And I think the experience of being in the locker rooms, of getting the work experience, whether through volunteer or what have you, allows me the opportunity and the right to call it out and to speak up about it. So when I do see it, I can call it out or I can just say it outright and have examples when I'm in trainings or, or coaching rather than feeling like an imposter by trying to call someone else out and not having actually lived or done the work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not entering spaces that I have no idea about. I've worked in these spaces and done training in these spaces, which has allowed me to use my voice confidently. And I think that experience through and confidence allows me to have my message speak out loud. Can mindfulness help break down some of those biases and barriers? Um, and if so, how and which ones? Yes, it definitely can. And mindfulness, again, I keep saying meet, allows folks to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. And it does that because we are leading with this curiosity and kindness. Curiosity, again, meaning of wonder and interest. So if we're interested in of wonder of what's happening in our immediate experience, what's happening around us, and we're tapping in mind and body to kind of understand or we're trying to understand by picking up on those sensations, whatever they may be, then that allows us to have more intelligence, both bodily intelligence from tapping in with our body and the physical intelligence, more emotional intelligence from awareness of the mind, but then by being okay with where we're at present moment, being okay with the here and now. So I like to say your right foot is here and your left foot is now. And if we click our heels like Dorothy, we're in the here and now, which brings us to our present moment. We can't take our feet into the past. We can't walk them into the future. We can only look down and say, my right foot is here. My left foot is now. So I'm in the present moment. And within that, that is our power. And once we understand our power, then we can step. And so allowing us to take our best step, allowing us to connect with others, the ability to understand through curiosity allows for all these levels to unfold, which creates a new experience, a new way of being. And I think that's why mindfulness is even catching on as a buzz phrase because it allows so many things to arise if we mm -hmm. just get out the way if we stop the judgment if we stop thinking that we know better when we no one has been in an experience like this like this pandemic so being of it allows us to be of service mm -hmm. And when we just try to win W-I-N by asking what's important now, then it allows us to understand where we're at, allows us to understand where our neighbor's at by listening. And through that, we can create community. And that's truly what we need and what we want so that we can feel that belonging. We can feel like we have a place in our own community. Mm -hmm. And not like we're looking over our shoulders. I love that. I love the uh, here and now, right foot, left foot. That's wonderful. 
<laughs> that's and the and the, I mean the clicking the heels like that's memorable, right? That's a that's a memorable thing to say. Um, <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for that rate. I appreciate you bringing your community here. So our guest tonight is Jason Gant. If you are um, interested in asking any questions, we do have a question queue open. Our topic tonight is mindfulness, well being, and how it intersects with DEI. So feel free to ask any questions via the chat. Frost. Half, thank you for that effort there. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank y'all you feel free joining. to, yeah, y'all feel free to engage in, in the chat if you want. Mindfulness can be a really great tool to help you sit with discomfort, regulate your own emotions, learn from those around you. Um, do you have any personal examples of how you put mindfulness to work in an uncomfortable situation or how it helped you be more inclusive? I mean, the first first story that comes to mind is just using it in an outdoor context so that this was my first time doing mindfulness teaching outdoors, super excited. Always, I had done it in um, conference rooms or classrooms, um, gyms, but always indoors. And mm-hmm. so always places where you kind of had to like keep your voices down. And so this was really exciting. It was like, all right, we're outdoors. You know, you can be as loud as you want. Like, what does mindfulness mean when there are no volume restrictions? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, was out there with, how old were they? From five to eight years old, neurodivergent youth running a social emotional learning camp. And neurodiversity, meaning that they're on the spectrum and what I quickly realized is that those on the spectrum have a very keen understanding of how they feel and can demonstrate it in a demonstrative way. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, non-spectrum folks do the same thing and it's just called, I'm having a bad day. Mm -hmm. So using mindfulness, meeting my campers where they were at, there was one day where we were out you know, jumping on logs on a walk, just letting them roam around and play tag. And next thing you know, two of the boys picked up sticks and they're they're playing, um, they're using them as guns and pointing at each other and making mm. gun sounds. And, and the first thought in my head was like to yell and say, you know, stop that or, you know, just to, just to stop that action just right. my first thought put a was halt like, to oh, it yeah boys guns that's not good they're too young yeah, right <laughs> you know stop this um and then i think the mindfulness my personal mindfulness practice allowed me to have that sacred pause and catch myself and say wait you know you're the leader you're the emotional coach here so set the tone and what is a better way to teach or use this as a moment or mm-hmm. is this even a moment you know is this right. a moment like yeah. do you not want to do too much so anyhow was able to stop the boys from playing um because they were kind of running so just kind of getting in between them gently so that they could stop running and just shared you know hey like it doesn't feel good to hurt our friends right like we're making friends here at this camp And they both agreed, like, yeah, we're trying to make friends and kind of say like, we're just playing. Mm -hmm. And and it was like, okay, well, that's great that you guys are playing and making friends. Let's not hurt our friends. Let's not shoot our friends. And, you know, I said, if anything, or I may have asked them, you know, what they're shooting. They said bullets. And I said, all right, well, how about let's not shoot bullets at our friends and let's share love, love. And so... 
I was like, I kind of just told him like, hey, from now on, you're shooting love potion. And Aww. so from then on, I love that. <laughs> they started picking up their, their sticks and they're like, oh, love potion, love potion. And so they're like chasing each other with love potion now instead of bullets. Mm-hmm. And so that's just one example that comes to mind of how to infuse mindfulness into the coaching or the teaching or just in everyday life. You know, it didn't have to be a camp. I could have been a parent and their child or whoever. Yeah. Um, and the mindfulness piece is the awareness of mind and body. So, all right, my mind just went to stop. My body wants to run over there. Instead of doing that, we can walk over there like they're not in trouble. <clears throat> but I do want to correct something. And so having that sacred pause and then having the second piece, which is the curiosity and kindness. All right. So what, how can I allow them to continue playing? Right. Not disrupt their fun altogether, but just switch the goal, switch the perspective make it more loving instead of trying to quote unquote hurt, which they, you know, don't know what they're really doing per se at that age, but don't even need that to be, you know, a a habitual just thought of like Mm -hmm. shooting and bullets where we can just redirect that to shooting love potion and instilling some compassion for our friends that we're, we're meeting. So yeah, and you and you met them where they are, right? Because you went up to them and you're like, "Hey, what what are you shooting? Like what what are you doing?" And they're, "Well, we're just playing and play is an important thing, right? So how can we change it a little bit?" I really um I really think that meeting kids especially where they are and like asking, genuinely asking them what they mean by what they said and then listening to their answers is such a really important thing that um a lot of people don't take the time to do. Um cuz I know like I've had to have the sex talk with my seven-year-old already because he asked me what sex was. And I said, what do you mean? What do you mean by what is sex? Like, what's the context for what you're asking me? And the first time he asked it, he meant like, what is sex as in gender? And so that was a real easy, cause that was like a year ago. That was a much easier conversation than whenever you hear what is sex? Like I was like, okay, here we go. But no, he just literally meant what do you, what does that mean? Like, what does this mean? Sex? And I'm like, well, yeah male, female, you know, another gender, like that's what that term means in the context that you're asking. But had I not asked, I would have gone down a whole separate conversation that he wasn't interested in knowing like, or or maybe he was interested in knowing, but he hadn't asked me to explain. (laughs) So so you, I, I really like that you, you met the kids where they were and you took in the information and it's, it is hard to pause with kids, especially if you're like, stop, stop doing something right now. Cause it does, it interrupts their fun. And, and you yeah. don't want to, you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. <They're fun>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I appreciate that. And thank you for your awareness and just catching that. Cause that could have been a very interesting uh, <laughs> rabbit hole. I have had to go down that rabbit hole since then with him, but you know, you just, you got to give kids information. They're going to get it somewhere. The internet is yeah. full of, full of things you don't want them to find. So it's better if you explain it as a parent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I was just talking about that today. I was like, man, I can't imagine like taking a kid to like their first bus route or like trying to teach them like to memorize their house number. I was like, wait, they don't even need to memorize a house number anymore. It's just in their phone. Like, yeah. And it was like, wow, you know what? Yeah. Anyhow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So Bite Mark asks, what is your favorite poem? Favorite poem. Mm -hmm. So um, I pulled one up and I'll go ahead and read it. And I just know it as the sidewalk poem. Have you heard of it? No. All right. So I'll read it. This is, it has um, five chapters, but it's quick. So it says autobiography in five chapters. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. 
I fall in. I am lost. I am hopeless. It isn't, it isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five. I walk down another street. So that came to mind when asked that question because it really encapsulates mindfulness for me, what mindfulness means to me as a practice, and ultimately how easy it is to be on autopilot in our entire life. And I see mindfulness as a way to step into aware, as a way to walk down that different street before having to fall in four times. Yeah. It's that new perspective that gives us the opportunity and the chance to create a condition that is different from our routine, habitual, you know, reactive selves. And so that, that poem really speaks to me because I've probably done that a million times. Or I know I've done that a million times in my life. And so just to read that is just like, wow, like how did it take that many chapters? <laughs> yeah. Let's say you don't get along with someone and you're asked to do something at work uh, with them. Or if you're a kid, you're asked to do, uh, you're the, they're picked for your school partner and you don't get to change. How can mindfulness help in that situation? Mindful. I mean, the first thing that comes to me, we, we brought up some, some tools. So I'll share another, another tool here, mindful listening. Mm -hmm. So mindful listening is all about putting on your curiosity cap. You're, you're putting on that cap to understand, to listen, and you are not cutting folks off before they're finishing their statement. So truly you're giving someone else the stage when they're speaking. A lot of times we hear like one mic, but then someone interrupts the one mic, so then there's this mic is the predominant mic. Mm -hmm. But instead, instead of having this one mic, just mindful listen. So when one person is speaking, fully give them the stage, fully give them the opportunity to get out their thought. And if they lose their train of thought for a second or two, not interrupting and jumping in with your own ideas, but that sacred pause, mm -hmm. allowing that sacred pause so that they can get back online and finish their train of thought. That skill, that tool that you can practice, which anyone can practice at the grocery store, just listening, you know, not jumping in, just sitting back and listening will allow you to give your partner some space to actually be heard, which also allows them to feel seen mm -hmm. and feel like there is a cooperation and collaboration versus. I don't want to work with you. So I would say that would be the, just the first step and something that you could do a skill that you could practice right now 
would be mindful listening and working with folks that may be different from you, may have a different way of thinking or that you've never met before. Give them the opportunity by mindfully listening, leaning in on curiosity, which is that interest and wonder, but then also that kindness. So even if it is different, we're not judging, we're not beating up, we're offering kindness. Yeah. And I, I will say it's hard, like whenever you're talking to someone, I do this at work a lot because I, at work, I'm like, all right, we're having a meeting. How short can we make this meeting? Like how quickly can we get this decision? Whatever decision is, let's get it. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. And so I have a tendency at work, especially to, um, if someone pauses, like I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's definitely a skill that I have had to work on myself, um, for work because I do have that tendency to jump in with my own thought. And, uh, what changed that for me was actually a personality test that we all took on my, on my team. And so we each took, um, insights, discovery or discovery insights. One of the two, um, we each took this personality test. And it was a very lengthy, not like Briggs Meyer, um, but similar length, but, um, and it gave us a printout of everything. And it was pages and pages and pages. Like, here's how you communicate. Here's the problem with your communication. Here's the strength with your communication. Like if you're working with someone who's opposite of you, here's how you should be working with them. Here's what you need to watch out for. And I read through that and it was like, you are a bull in a China shop and you need to slow down. And if someone comes in, like it gave me all of these things. And I was like, Oh God, this is really accurate. Like that's pretty scary. But it also gave me tips for like, don't jump in, right? <laughs> be let them like, let there be a natural pause <laughs> frost. I see you in chat. <laughs> He said, he said, can confirm, <laughs> but it's true because I am not, I'm not the kind of person who enjoys silence. Like if there's, if, if I'm working and I'm not in a meeting, like I've got music going, that's, <laughs> I need yeah. that. I need that stimulation to keep things going. And so, um, it is definitely something that I, <laughs> that I have had to work on. Bite said, mama needs to remember to breathe sometimes. True, true facts. I was actually recording a uh, intro for a podcast this morning. And as I was recording it, I was like, da -da 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 -da. Da -da -da. <laughs> okay, I had to, I had to end where I was going to do it. I was like, all right, you need to stop for a breath. Like you need to breathe. You need to make it sound better. <laughs> sometimes that, sometimes our body will force that moment to arrive if yes. we don't take it. Yeah. 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 So that's a hard thing, but I can, I have definitely, since I started making sure that I make room for other people in meetings and conversations, um, I get a lot more input and stuff gets done better the first time instead of having to have, you know, multiple iterations of things, uh, yeah. happen down the road. So, yeah. What a, what a little bit of space will do. Exactly. Yeah. So are there any regular habits you either maintain yourself or that you encourage your clients to develop that you feel might not get enough attention, uh, but that support overall well-being? Yeah, I mean, my my overall prescription is, is getting some movement in the morning, getting some mindfulness in for lunch and some yoga or a different slower movement in the afternoon or evenings. And so we're going in between that movement, stillness and movement. And I would say that that really is helpful, you know, and I'm saying movement could be dance, playing basketball, do, just play in general. Um, so doing some play, getting some mindfulness in, which is around some stillness and then getting into yoga getting back to like some easeful movement to allow us to get some restful sleep and going between those three play meditation, mindfulness, and, uh, yoga, Tai Chi, Pilates, going on a walk, you know, just doing something active, but not at that, that high intensity level. Yeah. I, that's great. I mean, um, I used to do yoga quite a bit <laughs> and then, and then I kind of stopped. Like, that's one thing that, um, 
I feel like I should probably start up again, but I like the kind of kind of book ending there with more intense movement and then and then less intense movement at night um, to kind of get your it's important to get your body ready for sleep and it's hard to do sometimes. Yeah, and I mean the just breathing. You know, I say that's a that's a movement exercise. We're moving the breath through the body. You know, we're physically telling with intention our mind to take an intentional breath not one that our body is naturally doing for us. And so that can be its own physical practice. So just going between the movement and the stillness, it's what I would recommend because that's what we're naturally doing. We're, we're maneuvering and managing our own energy. And so instead of getting caught up in that tailwind of our responsibilities, naturally having some movement and stillness designed within your own day. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of designing your day. I don't know that I've ever heard it called that before, but I think that's a really cool thing of instead of scheduling, designing, designing what your day is going to do and how it's going to serve you. I think that's a really good, uh, good phrase. I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> awesome. Please do design yeah. your day. Bite yeah, today. So mine starts, mine's, mine's a little dance and then I do mindfulness and then do some yoga start i actually do some tai chi with a group in the in a park close by my house so do some tai chi in the mornings and then have a mindful morning virtual group online oh that's cool work, yeah check in with them from 8 45 to 9 30 daily so able to get my mindfulness with the group in a group setting online and then go on a mindful walk during the day, during the afternoon sometime, do a mindful meditation on calm or headspace, or you just in silence. And then ending the night with some reading, doing some breathing exercises, and then, you know, doing a little light yoga or stretching. Mm -hmm. So what do you do on like on your group sessions in the mornings? What kind of things do y'all do or, or talk about to kind of get you in that mode for the day? Yeah, well, we just set an intention, honestly. So we go around, do a check-in, set, everyone sets an intention, why they joined for this day, today, and go around, hear folks' intention, and then we all drop in for a community meditation. That's really neat. I like that. Is that yeah. on, is that on like meetup or Facebook or how do, how would you, if you were looking for something like that, how would you go about finding something like that? Yeah, it's on zoom. It's uh, actually called the Dharma homies. So if you check out Dharma homies, uh, their website, you can join the crew. And are they, are they all local or is this from all around the, all around the world? Yeah, yeah it's all around. All around, we have folks joining from New York, New Jersey, Philly, folks are in New Mexico, Santa Cruz, uh, California. I'm in San Francisco. So we have folks joining from all over. That's amazing. That's really cool. I just put a link in the chat for anybody who's interested, uh, interested in that. Nice. So if you weren't doing, oh, go ahead. No, I just said, awesome. Thank you for dropping oh, yeah. in the Yeah. Room. Oh, absolutely. Um, actually, Bite said I had started doing a 10-ish minute yoga session to the waitlist video to kind of wind down, but I stopped. I should get back to that. Listen, I hope that this inspires you to get back to something like that. That's um, Also, you could see if your dog would do it with you. <laughs> you could be like yeah. the, the yoga dog lady. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or your kid. I mean, they already, they already have their downward dog down. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just working on the second post. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, if you weren't doing what you do now, or if you had chosen a different path, what would you be doing instead? Well, I did cho choose a different path, and that mm -hmm. was that path was. Um, you know, I transitioned from a public health undergrad degree and started working in finance for the next few years. And then the recession hit and then worked in um, big tech firms, Genentech and Google and things like that. Was going for the big name companies 
and transitioned into this. So I guess, you know, I guess I answered your question in reverse, but <laughs> <laughs> I think I tried out what I thought I wanted to do. And now I'm actually doing what I love doing. You're where you're supposed to be now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is time for the, the magic moment. And I just have to click this a couple times so it's not so intensely blinking. Um, but I have a magic wand here. And okay. I'm going to wave this magic wand and you get to eliminate one common opinion, misconception, or theory surrounding mental illness, uh, disabilities, or talking about mental health. And you get to tell me what that is. So there you go. It's been waved. What are you eliminating today? Um, I'm eliminating... How do I say this? The f I would I would like to eliminate the feeling or the perception, the stigma that people have in thinking that others are bulletproof, that others can take harsh criticism, can be talked down to, disrespected, um, oppressed. I would like to eliminate that and to let folks know that people feel that. Mm -hmm. People feel hurt, people feel, period. And so let's take away the pain, let's, let's connect and let's not aggressively or try to intently hurt folks. You know, people feel the bullets are hitting folks and let's stop that. So I'd like to eliminate this notion of emotions don't matter. You mm -hmm. don't feel that. Because as we heard with the WHO's definition of mental health, are you doing okay or are you not? Yeah. And if we just take it at that, how can I then best support you in putting your best foot forward? So I appreciate that one want. People yeah. Feel, let's get rid of the, the criticisms and the harshness people feel. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's really easy right now, especially because we're all behind keyboards right now. We're not in person, right? Well, I'm in Texas, so some people are in person, but you shouldn't be in person right now. <laughs> um, and it's easier for a lot of people to say things they wouldn't say to someone in person. So if you wouldn't say it to somebody in person, don't say it online. I mean, I'll, I'll just add, I'll just add to that. Like words still hurt when they're on the internet, <laughs> you yeah. know, there's still words. They still reach a person on the other side. So, um, if, and if you wouldn't say it to your mom and you wouldn't say it in person, don't say it at all, period. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think that's an, it's You're an important right. one. Sacred. Yeah. Yep. Sacred pause. I really, really like that uh, terminology, by the way. <laughs> awesome. Please use it. Please yeah. use it and share it. So I'll open it up to any remaining community questions. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And then I'll just kind of ask you, is there anything that we didn't cover or resources or sites or um, personal recommendations or anything that you want to talk about that we didn't cover tonight? Um. Yeah, just open to any questions. Let's see if any questions come mm -hmm. through. Um, just to continue the conversation, I'll just throw out the book Stealing Fire um, by Stephen Kotler. That's a great book that talks about the benefits um, and how to how high achieving folks have use mindfulness and how we can distill that down into a every day. So really good book. Um, and I would say it covers uh, different sectors as well, CEOs, Navy SEALs, athletes. Um, so check that out. Yeah, so I've got a I've got a link to that here on Goodreads, you buy it wherever you want. I try to provide good reads because they don't sell stuff. So <laughs> you can, you can buy it wherever you want to buy it. Okay. Awesome. But that's one I haven't read. So I'm going to add that to my, to my want to read list right now. Yeah, that's a good one. And then, um, 
Yes, another is the body keeps the score. The body keeps the score. So basically things that have happened to us, traumas, adversities, if we don't address them, acknowledge them, then they can come back at some point, whether that's just tension in the shoulders or low back problems, chronic conditions. Um, so that's an interesting read as far as how we treat our bodies, how the emotion remembers and translates into the body, but then also how we connect with each other through these stories that the body keeps. Mm -hmm. Um, Bites said, I feel awful that I missed the beginning of this one, but I'll definitely check out the VOD later. Absolutely. Do we have links where I can ask questions later if I still have them after watching? So I have a couple of links and then if you have any that you want to throw out there, but I've got your Twitter and your Instagram. Um, yeah. Twitter, so Instagram, um, best ways to reach me also on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, whatever you feel most comfortable. Let me grab, that's thank one I didn't have on here is your LinkedIn. <laughs> oh, all good. No, but so, thank you. And please reach out with any questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me find you on LinkedIn real quick. Also do coaching. So folks looking to start their own program. Here's the link then. All right, there we go. I wasn't prepared Any with that one. Come, come through. <laughs> no, nope, nothing. Questions? Doesn't look like it. But um, so I will just say again, thank you so much for joining today. Um, chat, no, give me, thank you. give me just a minute to disconnect with Jason, and I'll be back um in just a minute. And Jason, thank you again. Uh, this has been no, fantastic. No, this was awesome. Appreciate the space and the platform to share my experience and story. Great questions. Thank you for your audience being here. And I love the wand there. Yeah, yeah. That's what we got to get a little magic moment in there, right? <laughs> yeah.